Welcome to the Insomnia Coach Podcast. My name is Martin Reed. I believe that nobody needs to live with chronic insomnia and that evidence-based cognitive and behavioral techniques can help you enjoy better sleep for the rest of your life. The content of this podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not medical advice and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure or prevent any disease, disorder or medical condition. It should never replace any advice given to you by your physician or any other licensed healthcare provider. Insomnia Coach LLC offers coaching services only and does not provide therapy, counselling, medical advice or medical treatment. The statements and opinions expressed by guests are their own and are not necessarily endorsed by Insomnia Coach LLC. All content is provided as is and without warranties, either express or implied. For five years, Anna experienced short episodes of insomnia that would last for a week or two before disappearing. However, when her mother fell ill and required surgery, Anna found it very difficult to fall asleep, and this time, even though her mother recovered, Anna's sleep did not. For two years, Anna struggled to fall asleep at night, and this led to experimentation with sleeping pills, supplements, relaxation techniques, light-blocking glasses, sound machines, weighted blankets, and a lot of ongoing sleep-related research and worry. Anna got to the point where she just didn't feel sleepy when she went to bed, and this made her think that her sleep system was broken. Luckily, she began to implement evidence-based cognitive and behavioral techniques to help build sleep drive, rebuild sleep confidence, and create a strong association between her bed and sleep rather than unpleasant wakefulness. Today, Anna doesn't really think about sleep, and she gets somewhere around seven and a half to eight hours of sleep each night. In this episode, Anna shares everything she did to improve her sleep and also reveals how she coped with the typical setbacks most of us experience on the road to recovery. A full transcript of this podcast and an accompanying video can be found at insomniacoach.com forward slash podcast. So Anna, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come onto the podcast. Thank you for having me. So can you get us started right at the beginning? When did your problems with sleep begin and what do you think caused your initial issues with sleep? Um, sure. So in general, I have never been a very sound sleeper. I was never a person that took naps. I never really enjoyed sleeping in. So I think in general, like I always needed uh, less sleep than an average person, mm -hmm. but it was never really um, a big problem. And, and I was, I was actually quite happy with it. Mm -hmm. um, I started having short episodes of insomnia, I would say maybe around five years ago. Um, they would be triggered by something like a work related stressful event. And then I, I would have trouble falling asleep for maybe um, a week at a time or two weeks, and then it would generally resolve itself on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, two years ago, um, I had uh, a stressful event that was um, health related. So my mom was having some health issues and we didn't know exactly what was wrong with her. Mm -hmm. um, it lasted for quite a while and the doctors were running some tests. She needed to have a surgery. So the whole situation, I would say, lasted for maybe six weeks or, or so. Mm -hmm. And during that time period, I was having a hard time sleeping. Um, and I think this is when uh, my real sleep problems actually started. Mm -hmm. So before, like I said, uh, within a week or two, um, insomnia would resolve on its own. But this time, I think because of how long it lasted, and also because of the fact that I turned to sleeping pills a little mm -hmm. bit during that time uh, period, uh, even after the stressful situation resolved and everything went back to normal and it was basically the best possible outcome. So my, mom, my mom's health was fine. I was stuck with my sleep problems. So I was still not able to, to 
to fall asleep at night. Yeah. And I think you just touched upon it there. Was was the main issue just falling asleep at the start of the night or was it also some kind of struggle with waking during the night and finding it hard to fall back to sleep? Yeah, that's right. So I know there are different types of insomnia, right? So there is some people have, have problems waking up in the middle of the night and some people have problems waking up too early. Uh, for me, it was always falling asleep. Mm-hmm. So sleep onset insomnia. Um. And I would say uh, some nights I would also have issues with waking up during the night, but it was always mainly the main problem for me was falling asleep. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Um, I I think a lot of people are going to identify with your experience, you know, like so many people that struggle with chronic insomnia can actually identify with that idea that, well, I've never been a good sleeper for, you know, for as long as I can remember, I've always, you know, experience sleep disruption from time to time but then something happened and that was the time when my sleep just didn't recover by itself um and that's actually really common in people with insomnia you know and it fits this model that we actually have for chronic insomnia this 3p model whereby we the first p you know is predisposed some people are just more predisposed to sleep disruption then we have a the second p which is a precipitating factor which is, you know, whatever that event was that triggered the sleep disruption. And then normally, once that issue is no longer relevant, sleep recovers. But sometimes there's that third P, which are these perpetuating factors. And this is what makes it hard for our sleep to recover. And typically, these occur when the way we think about sleep changes. You know, we start to worry about sleep. If we're used to, for example, just going through these bad patches that last a few days and then suddenly they become a few weeks, we start to really worry. We start to do all that research um, about sleep, ex- different experiments. With um, we, we change our behaviors. You know, We might start going to bed earlier, trying to nap during the day when we never used to do that, staying in bed later, maybe calling in sick to work, canceling plans, trying to conserve energy, all those things that we quite understandably do in a bid to improve our sleep, but actually perpetuate the problem. Um, when it comes to those perpetuating factors, I see you've got that smile on your face. Do you, can you identify with any of them? Of course, yeah. I, I can 100% identify with many of the things you just mentioned. I think one for me that stood out, and because I actually have a lot of, a lot of uh, tendency to overanalyze, I was researching sleep. Mm. So that was my main task of the day. I would go to work and then I would go on insomnia related um, forums Mm -hmm. on the internet, or I would look at YouTube videos or I would read articles or I would research how harmful insomnia Mm. could be or the harmful effects of sleeping pills or how you could improve, um, you know, um, sleep latency. Uh, I basically became an expert and I was thinking about sleep constantly yeah. And um, as you can imagine, that didn't help right. because exactly. basically that was only fueling uh, my worry. And surely enough, I also, you know, I changed behaviors. I tried going to bed early. Um, I tried all of the different supplements. I tried different relaxation techniques. Um, so, um, yeah. So I think, as you mentioned, this is where the self-perpetuating cycle of of the thought and the thought patterns uh, that began to change. And this is where the chronic element of my insomnia set in. Yeah. It's, you know, everything that you did is completely natural that we want to do that, right? If there's a problem, we want to try and solve it. So we most, for most of us, that means just going online and lo- looking into looking for some information and advice. The problem with insomnia is so much of the messaging that's out there and the information out there just really is not helpful and can actually lead to even more sleep related worry. You know, I think you just touched upon it where you're seeing all these articles that say, Oh, if you don't get X amount of sleep, this is going to happen. If you take sleeping pills, this is going to happen. Everything out there, all the messaging around insomnia just is very alarmist in nature and makes you tend to worry about it more. I agree that a lot of the messaging out there is focused on people who don't prioritize sleep. Yes. Mm -hmm. And paradoxically, people who are looking at this content and researching things related to sleep are people who can sleep, right? Mm -hmm. So the target audience is a little bit um, off 
And I feel like for people who are struggling with sleep, warning them about the dangers of not sleeping is definitely not what they need to see. Yeah. Um, yeah, I 100% agree with you. Um, a lot of the messaging out there um, might be helpful for people that, you know, are just burning the candle at both ends and just not not paying attention to sleep. And as a result, they're deliberately depriving themselves of sleep. But the issue is, is those people aren't reading these messages. The people that are reading these messages are the people with insomnia that are struggling with sleep. And so much of the the kind of scare tactics that are being used just make insomnia even worse. And especially when it comes to things about, you know, these articles that claim insomnia causes certain health conditions, there's actually no evidence whatsoever that insomnia causes any health problem whatsoever. We see some studies that make associations, but the actual cause could be any number of things. Like even to this day, we've, we have no evidence of that. And what, there was this huge study that involved tens of millions of people that were, and they looked at people with insomnia and people without insomnia and tried to assess mortality risk. You know, does insomnia increase your risk of death? No difference whatsoever. It was exactly the same in the insomnia group and the non-insomnia group. So the problem is, is when we go online and we see this messaging, it's very rarely helpful because it just makes us worry about sleep even more. And as you said, you know, it just perpetuates the problem. Right. So it's a it's difficult for a person who's not familiar maybe with the scientific art of articles or with with um, mm. going in depth and doing their own research to distill the facts versus yes. you know an article that someone has just written and is, is claiming something that is not supported by evidence yeah exactly so in a way we have to kind of rely on journalism to pick these these very dry studies apart um, but unfortunately their motivation is to get attention and they're not going to get attention if they say uh, insomnia it kind of sucks but it doesn't cause a health problem you know that's not going to get attention but if they can come up with some grandiose claims you know um, interpreting the study in a certain way and emphasizing very small parts of the study then they can get their attention so yeah it is a problem um, but you, you know you kind of touched upon these, sci these scientific based techniques evidence you know as you know as I know as people that listen to this podcast know these cognitive and behavioral techniques, you know, they're, they're evidence-based. We, we know from experience, from study, from, there's so much clinical evidence that they work. Um, before you discovered them, though, what kind of things had you already tried to do in, an, in a bid to improve your sleep? Right. So um, I, I knew that this question uh, was probably coming. So I actually I wrote down some things because I did so many things yeah. in the year and a half that I was struggling with really bad insomnia that I, I would probably forget. Uh, so starting with, of course, um, cutting out caffeine. So I went from drinking maybe two to three cups of coffee a day to first only limiting it to one and then not drinking any coffee and then also cutting out tea and any caffeinated beverages, which made no difference um, whatsoever. I installed blackout blinds in my bedroom, um, which is, is nice to have right now, right? But when I was suffering from insomnia, it didn't make any difference at all. Mm -hmm. um, I tried different supplements. So um, you name it, I tried it. I tried melatonin. Um, magnesium, valerian root, um, 5-HTP, L-theanine, um, CBD oil, all of these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tried different uh, light-related tricks. So I got these orange glasses, uh, blue light blocking glasses, mm -hmm. uh, which are supposed to essentially um, block out all of the blue lights uh, blue light from the environment. And I was wearing them for two to three hours before bed. Mm -hmm. I had glasses that would um, that were emitting uh, blue green light that I would put on in the morning. Um, they were supposed to stunt um, melatonin production and similarly help to produce more melatonin the following night. Mm -hmm. um, I was using all kinds of different sound machines. Uh, mm -hmm. I put a fan in in my bedroom to make sure that it was kept cool. Uh, I got a gravity blanket, which is essentially like a weighted blanket. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's 
I think um, used in some with some psychiatric conditions um, to help people calm down. So mm-hmm. I was just using it um, as a cover when I was sleeping. And then, of course, I tried um, alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried smoking marijuana. I mm-hmm. tried all of the different conventional things that people also um, use to help themselves uh, fall asleep. The list goes on. Yeah. Uh, I would say some of these things helped for a little while. And some of the things may have improved the my sleep quality or the length of my sleep marginally or they did in the beginning and they stopped working um sometimes it was perhaps placebo that helped me a little bit Mm -hmm. but none of the 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 help uh they provided was uh persistent and i feel like the more i did the more i focused on sleep Mm -hmm. which was fueling this vicious cycle of thoughts yeah. I was basically always re- researching the, the next thing that I was going to do to see mm-hmm. what I could do to improve my sleep. Yeah, um, that, that's exactly the point that I wanted to make. And, you know, you made it for me is we, we try all these things quite understandably. Um, they might seem to help at first, probably because we're expecting them to help, you know, or we're convinced that they're going to help. So those first few nights, maybe we notice some improvement. Um, but then because they're not actually really helping, we, we kind of go back to square one, but the problem is then we become worried because this new thing didn't work. So then we have to look for something new. And then when that doesn't work, then we have to look for something new. And the whole time we're on this journey, we just get more worried about sleep and think more about sleep. And I mean, do you, that seems to me like that's what, what you were saying, you know, like you try all these things all it led to was more worry and more obsession about sleep. Does that sound about right? Yeah. So I felt by, by the time I actually turned to CBTI, I feel like I had tried literally everything, anything and everything yeah. under the sun. There mm-hmm. was nothing else I, I could have tried mm-hmm. to help my insomnia. Yeah. So, so what was it that made you... First of all, how did you find out about these cognitive and behavioral te- techniques and what gave you the motivation to give them a try? You know, because after all, you tried so many things before. And when people with chronic insomnia hear of another thing, you know, by this point, they're very skeptical. Like, I've heard this story before. Yeah. But people tell me this works. People tell me that works, but it doesn't work. So how did you find out about these techniques and w- what what gave you that motivation to get, get started and give them a try? Sure. So... I actually came across cognitive behavioral therapy um, for insomnia approach relatively early on in my research. Mm -hmm. So maybe I was uh, suffering with insomnia for like four or five months. And then I came across this technique that was based on restricting your sleep even further and then leaving your bed when you were not falling asleep within like five or 10 minutes. And it, to be honest, it just sounded really bad and I didn't give it a second thought. But I, I kept it in the back of my mind always. Mm-hmm. Um, and after I felt like I have tried everything else, uh, I, I felt like it was, it was the last resort. Um, either I tried this and it worked or I would be stuck with insomnia for the rest of my life. So I had nothing to lose. It sounded horrible, but my life was already horrible as it was. So it didn't really hurt to try it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you made a really good point that a lot of these techniques do seem really counterintuitive, you know, because your goal at the end of the day is to get more sleep. So one of the techniques, sleep restriction, which is a terrible name because it implies we're restricting sleep. But what we're really doing is just restricting the amount of time you allot for sleep because... People with insomnia, they often spend a lot of time in bed in a bid to try and get more sleep. But more time in bed doesn't mean more time asleep. It just means more time awake. Um, And more time awake just means more time worrying, more time tossing and turning. Unpleasant, right? So what we say is, well, how much sleep do you think you get on an average night? Let's say it's four, five hours. Maybe add like half an hour or an hour to that. And then only allow yourself to spend that much time in bed, only a lot that much time for sleep. 
Um, and this way you're spending less time awake during the night. And because you're allotting less time for sleep, you're giving enough time for sleep drive to build during the day. So you're going to be sleepy enough for sleep when you go to bed. Because that's another thing that many people with chronic insomnia do is they'll go to bed before they're sleepy enough for sleep um, and then get frustrated when they're not falling asleep. Um, and I think one reason why is because it's really easy to confuse fatigue with sleepiness, you know, so we can feel really worn out and fatigued, um, and think that that sleepiness, which is very common misperception, even people that don't have any sleep issues often confuse fatigue with sleepiness. So then we go to bed and quite rightly, we're not falling asleep, but then we become convinced that, you know, I'm not falling asleep. It's because of the insomnia. There's something wrong with me when what's happening is completely normal. So that's sleep restriction in a nutshell, which is building sleep drive, reducing the amount of time awake during the night. And then the other technique you touched upon, the idea of getting out of bed, that's helpful if we've kind of learned that the bed is an unpleasant place to be. You know, so more to do with when we wake during the night, you know, and our mind just goes into overdrive, we get really worried by the fact we've woken up and we're really struggling to fall back to sleep. It's often a good idea to just get out of bed, just do anything that you find relaxing and enjoyable until you feel calm again, and then return to bed. And again, it seems counterintuitive because you're thinking, I want to get to sleep. Why? How is getting out of bed going to help me? Well, if you're in bed awake, tossing and turning, you're not asleep anyway, so you might as well get out of bed, distract your mind, and not allow yourself to reinforce that idea that the bed is an unpleasant place to be. Um, so yeah, I thought it was a really good insight that you share with us. That a lot of people that maybe have explored these CBTI techniques before have thought, well, this sounds completely counterintuitive. So I appreciate that you gave me the opportunity to just touch upon a couple of those techniques and kind of justify the rationale behind them. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so as, as you said, some of these things sound really counterintuitive. But for example, the getting out of bed really changed my relationship with my bed. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that when I was suffering from insomnia, I would get terrible anxiety when the bedtime was coming and yeah. I would feel my body tense up and I would, I would feel like I was breathing faster and my whole body was tense when I was getting into bed. Mm -hmm. Now it's, it's completely different. I feel more relaxed. I'm associating my bed with rest and with mm -hmm. sleep. And it actually helps me fall asleep when in my when I'm in my bed. Yeah. I before uh, I I tried the uh, this approach, I was able to fall asleep on the couch much easier than than in my bed. Bed was the last place where I would ever fall asleep. Yeah, and that's that is a classic symptom of that conditioned arousal, you know. So just because we've learned that the bed is this place where we're gonna have a horrible night, we're gonna be wide awake, tossing and turning. Um, often in the short term, if we say, oh, well, I'm gonna go sleep on the couch then, then because you don't have that mental association between the couch and wakefulness and frustration and anxiety, you can find it easy to fall asleep on the couch. Um, but that really isn't a long-term solution unless your goal is to sleep on the couch for the rest of your life. You know, really what we need to do is just rebuild that, that association between the bed and sleep, you know, make you think of the bed as a pleasant place to be. Um, just like it was in the past, but unfortunately the only way we can do that is by making sure that you're only in bed when you're calm, relaxed or asleep. You know, in every single minute that you spend in bed, when you are calm, relaxed or asleep, you're rebuilding that association to make the bed a strong trigger for sleep again. Um, okay, so that's good. So, so I think it was around, this was back in around October, middle of October time, um, you started with sleep restriction. Uh, do you remember how much time you were allotting for sleep before you tried this and how much time... You, how much time you change this to be allotting for sleep? Sure. So uh, usually I have to wake up at around 8 a.m. to go to work. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was aiming for the perfect eight hour uh, mm -hmm. hours of sleep. So I would go to bed around midnight, maybe 1130. Mm -hmm. um, and then surely enough, I would toss and turn for hours and maybe then fall asleep around two or three. Mm -hmm. uh, am 
so that was that was before I tried um, sleep restriction. Mm-hmm. Um, when I started applying a restricted sleep window, I went for six hours. Mm-hmm. So I would go to bed at two a.m. Mm-hmm. and I would aim to wake up at eight a.m. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's 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 really common. You know that because we've got all this messaging that we need eight hours of sleep. So many of us, therefore, a lot eight hours of sleep. You know, because we a lot the amount of time for sleep that we want to be getting and yeah. that amount of sleep, right? So it makes right. sense. So a lot of people with insomnia, I do find that when I start working with them, they're allotting around about eight hours, sometimes even more time for sleep. Um, you know, and it's just it's just not helpful. We want to a lot the amount of time for sleep so it's similar to the sleep you're currently getting you know and then once you start to get results once you start filling that sleep window with sleep this isn't you're not going to be restricting your sleep window forever this is just to kind of get you started you know and once you start filling up that sleep window with sleep that's when you can start gradually extending it out um, and just see what kind of overall sleep duration you're capable of sustaining over the longer term uh, yeah i i would I guess like to say that if someone is struggling with falling asleep, so sleep onset insomnia, this can be particularly hard because not being able to fall asleep for three or four hours when your sleep window is only six hours really doesn't sound appealing at all. I felt like, okay, I will go to sleep around 11. Mm -hmm. I need to wake up at 8 a.m., maybe I will fall asleep after three or four hours and maybe I will get the five hours Mm -hmm. and maybe I will function somehow, but I'm definitely not going to be able to function if I get one hour or two hours. Right. So it just, it sounded really frightening because I was really convinced that it's, this is what essentially this is going to lead to. I was only going to get one or two hours of sleep every Mm -hmm. night. And, and surely enough, this is how it started. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I remember I think you were like a week and a half in um, and you got really concerned because you felt that things were actually getting worse, you know, that your sleep was getting worse. It wasn't getting better. So can you can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So the first week of sleep restriction, I felt like I made some progress. So I was positively surprised. I was quite sleepy when my sleep window was starting i would maybe fall asleep within half an hour to an hour uh i was pleased but then something happened i think i had one bad night and Mm -hmm. that made me anxious i started thinking okay maybe this is not working for me Mm -hmm. of course it doesn't work for 100 percent of the people who try it right so i'm probably one of those and it's not gonna work for me and then this anxiety fueled another bad night and another one and then um uh yeah i think i think i had a little setback uh in week two Mm -hmm. but then um i think my sleep drive won so (laughs) so later even though i was still nervous and i was still getting anxious before bed i started sleeping more deeply and more consistently Mm -hmm. and i think when I really started seeing consistent improvement was in week four. Mm -hmm. Then I would say I would regularly fall asleep within 10 to 15 minutes and I would sleep during the whole sleep window that I was allotting for sleep. Yeah. You know, you, you made a really important point there that, you know, your sleep drive won. your sleep drive got to that point where you did sleep. And that's something really important to bear in mind is the sleep drive does always win in the end, you know? So there may be blips, ups and downs along the way, completely normal. Um, when you experience a few bad nights, you know, that's ultimately that's okay because what happens from night to night isn't that important because you're looking to make these long-term improvements. So what happens from night to night doesn't matter all that much. If you stay consistent with the techniques, sleep drive will always win in the end, you know, because you can't stay awake indefinitely. And every hard night, every night of short sleep builds that sleep drive, builds that sleep pressure and makes sleep more likely the following night. It's, it's difficult to, Im- to imagine for someone with insomnia. I, I know that it was true for me. I, I really didn't think I had any sleep drive left. I don't, I didn't remember ever feeling sleepy. I would maybe feel tired, but I was never sleepy. 
-hmm. I would go to bed and sometimes fall asleep, but it was not this pleasant, drowsy feeling that I was getting. It was just, it felt more like passing out that I was not really aware of. Mm -hmm. Um, So I really felt like something was inherently broken with my sleep system. And from the research, all the research that I did on the internet, uh, it, it didn't seem like it was possible. But I was convinced that I was the exception. My sleep, mm. my sleep drive, my sleep system didn't work, which was, of course, it was not true. It was not the case. Yeah, exactly. It's so important to recognize that we never lose our ability to sleep. You know, it's something that is with us forever. Um, but this, when we have a high level of worry or anxiety, arousal around sleep, it can definitely suppress those sleepiness cues and make sleep more difficult. And that can lead us to believe that we've somehow lost our ability to sleep or there's something uniquely wrong with us, you know, and that's almost certainly never going to be the case. Um, But, uh, you know, and it's also really important to recognize that when you're implementing these techniques, it's completely natural to be disheartened when you have setbacks because your sleep confidence is going to be really poor. You know, you, you're at that stage where let's say you have that week of good sleep and you just start to get that little bit of confidence back but then you maybe just have that one night, you know, where it's a struggle again. Um, And instead of thinking of those seven nights previously that were pretty good, your brain just wants to focus on that one night, you know, and then all of that confidence you've been building, it can so easily shatter. Um, So I think it's really important to make that conscious effort to focus your attention on all the good nights rather than just allowing your brain to naturally focus on, the minority of nights or that, that one night that was really difficult. It's really important to keep the big picture and it's always easier to remember bad things than good things. Yes. And it's always easier to focus on something that happened yesterday versus yeah. something that was consistently happen, happening for the past two weeks. So I feel like keeping a sleep diary really helped. I, I always um, kept the time that I went to bed, how long it took me to uh, fall asleep, how many hours I spent asleep, uh, how much time I was awake during the night when I woke up. And looking back on it and consistently um, across weeks, I felt like I was able to get a big picture and not get discouraged by, by bad nights that were, of course, happening here mm-hmm. and there once in a while. Yeah, I think that that can be helpful, you know, just keeping some basic journaling of of your sleep. Um, On one hand, sometimes people can get a little bit too obsessed with it, you know, and record it and then just spend a lot of time looking at it every single day, running all these numbers and crunching it and stuff like that, which is not the intention, you know, we're just looking to track progress. So um, if you kind of log information about your sleep, like you just described, I try and encourage people just to not pay much attention what happens night to night maybe at the end of a week or at the end of two weeks, you know, look at it just so you do get that bigger picture because otherwise it's really easy. You know, let's say you had a really good night. You kind of gloss over that. Oh yeah, last night was great. Then you go off, have your breakfast. Um, But then the next night, maybe you only got two hours of sleep and you're just sitting there thinking about that, running all the numbers. Why did I only get two hours sleep that night? That the brain kicks in and you're just, you know, you're just feeding that obsession with sleep, which is never helpful. Uh, So I 100% agree that it's not useful to look in depth into the data every day. And I I had this problem. So I had a Fitbit, Mm -hmm. um, which has a sleep tracker in it. Mm -hmm. And whenever I would wake up, that was the first thing that I did. I would look at how I slept, how many hours of deep sleep I got, how it compared uh, to, uh, you know, what was expected. Um, What helped me? was looking at the big picture. So looking at, oh, how was my sleep this week? How did it compare to the previous week? Um, uh, How was my sleep efficiency in this given month? Mm -hmm. But definitely not looking at at sleep data day to day. I also, I took off my Fitbit. I don't wear it anymore. And I don't even want to be tempted. I know it's tempting. Mm -hmm. Um, Right now that I'm sleeping well, I'm really tempted to put it back on again. But at the same time, I'm scared. And Mm -hmm. I, I also know that, we shouldn't be relying on um, a tracker to tell us how rested we feel or how tired we feel or how, how much we should be sleeping. We, we know it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I know now when I feel rested and I know when I feel tired and I know yeah. when I feel sleepy and I, we, should, we should be relying on our body for these cues. 
Yeah, I completely agree. You know, if you're getting through the day, you feel like you've got enough energy to get through the day, you're having productive days, um, then the chances are you're sleeping fine, regardless of how many hours you're getting. Um, and no kind of tracking device can tell you if you personally are getting enough sleep, because we all have our own individual unique sleep requirement. Some people might function perfectly fine on four or five hours of sleep. Other people might feel like they need nine or 10 hours. You know, there's a huge range and everyone is different. Um, and yeah, with those sleep tracking devices, especially for people with insomnia, they really can just heighten that, that anxiety, that arousal and just lead to this obsession um, over data that we're still not 100% sure how accurate it is, especially in people with insomnia. They tend to really struggle to determine between wakefulness and sleep. But we can't really do much with the information that it gives us, you know, because you touched upon like sleep stages. We can't control how much time we spend in each sleep stage. Our body does that by itself. Um, we can't control how long it takes us to fall asleep. We can't control how much time we're going to be awake during the night. So all this data that we're getting back from these devices we can't do anything with it. The only thing we can do with it is worry about it. Right, yeah. I, I remember countless times I tried to put together the behaviors that led to more increased deeper sleep on a given night. And then yeah. whenever I tried to replicate, it just didn't work. So I felt like it was completely useless. Yeah. Uh, the, the data was was not replicable and I was not able to you know, consistently get to the same results by implementing a certain behavior so it could be you know that the, the the tracking device which will be able to really tell us something true about our sleep is 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 you know yet to come out but yeah i don't think it's available at this point yeah no i think perhaps they they could be helpful if you're one of these people that really feels you get zero minutes of sleep like you've gone for let's say two weeks and not even had one minute of sleep which would be pretty much impossible but it's very easy to believe that that's the case that then it might be helpful temporarily to use one just to get that relief you know because it will show that you are sleeping because it's pretty much impossible to be awake for that long but otherwise i just find that they can be really unhelpful and actually perpetuate the problem because they lead to this obsession with sleep. So you kind of, I just wanted to go back to, you know, that period when you were struggling during that sleep window. So many people would just be tempted to think, oh, this isn't working and, you know, just go on to move on to something else. How, how did you get through that, that rough patch and just stay persistent and consistent and get through it and keep going? Right. So, like I said, I tried everything else and this was my last resort. Um, I was prepared to really give it a go. And I, at some point, I remember uh, telling my boyfriend that I was going to give it six weeks. I was mm -hmm. going to give it my best. And if it didn't work in six weeks, then I would give up. Then I would accept the fact that I'm going to have insomnia for the rest of my life or start taking sleeping heavy duty sleeping pills, you know, every night that was just, you know, what I, what I was going to live with. Uh, but I was committed to really trying it and sticking mm. to it for that specific set period mm. of time. I think that's really helpful. Um, and I think six weeks is a pretty good period to, to give yourself and just set it and forget it, you know, engage that robot mind and just be no matter what, for six weeks, I'm going to do it. Um, I think that's a good enough time frame to at least notice some consistent improvements in sleep. Some people I feel like don't give it long enough. You know, they might just say, I'm going to give it two weeks or one week. Um, I think six weeks is, is, is an appropriate time frame, And that's a good strategy because you don't know unless you try, right? And if you give yourself enough time, um, you just focus exclusively on what, this one thing for six weeks. Um, if it doesn't work, then you know it doesn't work because you've given it time, you've given it a good chance. Um, but it could work. And after six weeks, it almost certainly will work. I um, don't think I know of anyone that's implemented sleep restriction correctly and consistently for six weeks and not noticed improvements in their sleep. So that's, that, that was a really good insight that you just shared there. I appreciate that. Yeah, um, yeah. I remember I was struggling to find information online regarding how long I should do it and mm. what is the average time that people start seeing improvements. And really, there there is no consistency out there. And I know 
it varies from person to person and everybody is different. But I think if people got a clear guideline that, you know, after six weeks or two, two months, you're mm-hmm. definitely going to see yeah. some improvement, they would know what to expect and they would know what they would need to stick to to definitely start seeing some improvement. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, I think maybe the messaging needs to be improved just to help set realistic expectations. You know, that this these techniques do require a lot of effort, a lot of willpower, a lot of consistency, and they do take time to work and there's going to be ups and downs along the way. It's not like this miracle cure. It's not like, um, you know, pop a pill or and then suddenly you're going to sleep. It's something that does take effort and does take a little bit of time to work, but it's worth it because once you recognize that it does work, that's a skill that's then with you for the rest of your life. So if sleep ever becomes a problem again, you know exactly what to do. You just reach into your back pocket and just start implementing these techniques again. So um, I, one thing I also wanted to touch upon was you said, you know, how if you're already struggling to fall asleep, it's taking you a couple of hours in those early days of sleep restriction when you're going to be allotting less time for sleep, you can get this worry that, well, now I've got even less time available for sleep. If it's going to take me a couple of hours to fall asleep, this means I'm only going to be getting maybe two or three hours of sleep. And that can just trigger all this worry and anxiety. Um, how did you address that, that, that concern? Um, I didn't. Um, I, I was worried and I was concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, I realized though that when I was not taking sleeping pills, I would generally feel better than I expected mm-hmm. uh, on the days that I got, you know, two to three hours of sleep. I felt like maybe I, my body was in a state of hyper arousal. I don't know, but some days I felt completely fine. Mm-hmm. And then I, I felt like that actually helped decrease my anxiety. Uh, you know, they were not maybe the best days of my life. I was maybe not performing uh, at my peak and I was not killing it at work and I was not the nicest person, but I was fine and I was surviving. And if you look at me from the outside, you wouldn't know that I was struggling with, with insomnia. So that was that was helpful realization uh, that I had. Um, and it was actually uh, also the fact that it was not that many nights where I only got two or three hours of sleep. Mm. On most nights, um, after I started imp- implementing the, the sleep window, I would generally get more than that and I would fall asleep faster. And mm. I would definitely wouldn't struggle to fall asleep for as long as I did before implementing the sleep window. Yeah. Yeah, I think you made a couple of really good points there that, you know, it's it's, it's kind of this trade-off, maybe a little bit of short-term pain, but for that long-term gain, you know, so maybe there might be one or two nights when it's still going to take you a couple of hours to fall asleep. So maybe you'll miss out on a little bit, you know, that night or the second night, the third night. Um, but really it's, you know, that doesn't really matter that much because you're building sleep drive. So the future nights are going to get better. And a lot of this worry about how long it's going to take me to fall asleep, how much sleep am I going to get is connected to worry about what the next day is going to be like. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's really easy to focus on all the bad things that have maybe happened in the past and attribute them to a bad night of sleep. When in reality, the amount of sleep we get doesn't have as much impact on our days as we often think. Um, and some of us can be quite surprised, you know, about, how good or how productive our days are or just some good moments during the day, even after just a couple of hours of sleep. And that's something that's really important to bear in mind too. This was a big source of my worry. So the next day performance and how I would feel the next day was stressing me to the point that I was having nightmares about going to work and not being able to remember anything or Mm -hmm. being in a meeting or giving a presentation and, and, forgetting things completely and it never happened in in real life so like i said sometimes i was not feeling on my best but it was never as severe as it would uh, appear to be mm-hmm. in in my dreams about yeah. about this problem yeah absolutely that's 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 really important to to consider i like to ask people you know have you ever had a good night of sleep and had a bad day 
And if you have, then it shows that a good night of sleep doesn't always mean a good day. So therefore, a bad night of sleep doesn't always mean a bad day. Um, it's really the quality of our day is largely down to what we decide to do during the day um, rather than how well or how poorly we sleep. So I think you, you mentioned that, you know, you gave yourself this six weeks. So you, you kind of set it and forget it, gave yourself six weeks. Um, you got those results that you were looking for. I think you said after about the four week mark, you, you felt that you were doing really well. Um, but then I remember you at the, at, around the six week mark, you went away for a weekend and there was like a time difference. You went traveling, noticed some sleep disruption, um, can you talk us through that? What happened next? So this is one of those things, you know, sometimes when your sleep confidence is a bit fragile, you then you might start to worry again and think these techniques aren't working. So can you just talk us through that? What happened? Sure, yeah. So I, I went on holidays. Um, I went to uh, Russia, which is three hours ahead, mm -hmm. time zone-wise, from where I'm currently living, which is mm -hmm. Ireland. And I remember I was traveling with my boyfriend. We arrived at the hotel. It was 3 a.m., which means it was 12 um, a.m. In, in Ireland. And I was still all wired from the travels. Yeah. But, of course, it was 3 a.m., so it was time to go to bed. Mm -hmm. um, I was not feeling sleepy, but we were in a hotel. It was middle of the night. Uh, I had nothing else to do. My boyfriend went to sleep. So I went to sleep. And I didn't sleep. And I think I maybe got two hours of sleep that night. Uh, I, I spent the night basically lying in bed and thinking about the next day and mm. how awful it was going to be and how I'm not going to enjoy myself on a holiday and how much my life sucks because yeah. of my insomnia. Basically feeling sorry for myself. Uh, the, following night, the following day was okay. Uh, the following night, I held myself with... Um, quite a bit of alcohol. I slept through the night and then that gave me quite a lot of anxiety the following day, mm. which led to another bad night. So overall I had three pretty bad nights. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I remember after coming back, the first night was also really bad. Mm -hmm. And I was like, great. I, I fell back into a pattern. I, I destroyed everything that I've built up over those six weeks. Um, but I think that's where, that's where the problems ended. So the next night, I, I slept like a baby. And mm -hmm. I, I got the feeling that I, I think perhaps all the sleep drive that I have built over the weekend was helping me sleep even better. And after I got back to the familiar conditions and I got back to my routine, I went right back to, to, to sleeping um, throughout the whole sleep window and, and feeling good. Yeah, I think you, that's a perfect example of sleep drive winning in the end. You know, sleep drive always wins in the end. Um, you know, high levels of worry and anxiety can definitely disrupt sleep and kind of suppress sleepiness, but it, they can only ever last for so long. Eventually, sleep drive gets to this point where it makes sleep happen. Um, and it's really important to recognize that when you're traveling, especially when you're crossing time zones, sleep is always going to be disrupted. It would be unusual for you to have gone, gone to your hotel that night and slept like a baby. Some people do, like sounds like your boyfriend did, um, but that's more on the unusual side. Most people will struggle um, for a few days, um, at least when they're, when they're crossing time zones. Um, and I think, so I think that your sleep recovered for two reasons. One, first of all, sleep drive just made, made you sleep again. And second of all, you didn't engage or you resisted the urge to engage in all these behaviors that then perpetuate that temporary sleep disruption. You know, so it sounds like you weren't tempted to start going to bed earlier again, trying to nap during the day, modifying your day. You know, you stayed really consistent with the techniques. And so your sleep just got back on track as soon as the travel disruption wasn't an issue anymore. Yeah, that's right. I knew better by then uh, than to go to bed earlier. I, it didn't even cross my mind. I definitely knew that as soon as I came back, I was going to go back to the exact same sleep window and I was going to implement the exact same routine that led to improving my sleep the first time around. Mm -hmm. So that obviously worked.
Yeah. So staying on that, that note of travel, I remember that I think it was, so th this is like three months after you first started with sleep restriction. Now um, you were getting around like seven or eight hours of sleep each night and you'd gone on vacation again. So was, was this, was that trip a little bit later on? Was that any different? Were you struggling again during that trip or were things a little bit better that time around? I, I wasn't. So all the way to when the trips started, I was, definitely sticking to a cons consistent sleep window. Um, I extended it by then to seven hours or seven hours and, and 15 minutes, but I was definitely trying to go to sleep at the same time every day and, and wake up at the same time and definitely not sleep longer than that. Mm -hmm. um, but I went on holidays and I was, I was a little bit afraid of course, because there would again be a time difference this mm -hmm. time of seven hours. Yeah. And I didn't know whether I would be able to keep a consistent sleep schedule <clears throat> even in that time zone. And also we would be moving around quite a lot. So I would be in different hotel rooms uh, in different places. So that would yeah. introduce quite a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but I think by then my, my sleep had already recovered to the point that I, I didn't struggle at all. Uh, yeah. It was not an issue. Um, I think I was also not stressed with work. So that was definitely helpful. Um, but I was going to bed together with my boyfriend. I was sleeping maybe eight hours a night, you know, mm -hmm. seven and a half, eight hours, sometimes longer. And I would sometimes sleep in in the morning and sometimes I would go to bed later and sometimes earlier. And it was generally, I felt like a normal sleeper again. You yeah. know, I, I, I forgot the, what it was like to not think about sleep and not worry about sleep. But during that vacation, I experienced exactly that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I wonder if it was just, you know, you're at that point because it was further down the line where you just had a little bit more confidence in your sleep, you know, so you worried, naturally worried less about it. Um, and because you were worrying less about it, putting less pressure on yourself to sleep, sleep, sleep was easier all that time around on that vacation. Um, and I think it's also important to recognize that you know, when you're on vacation, what, what do you go on vacation for? You know, these holidays, it's the daytime activity that's the focus, right? You have so much fun during the day. What really happens at night is, you know, doesn't really matter. It's all these activities and all these things you're doing during the day that count. Um, but yet, when you ha don't have that sleep confidence, every, all your thought process is about what's going to happen at night. But if you just shift your attention to all the great things you're going to be during, doing during the day, then, you know, you won't be worried about sleep. So you'll have a better day um, and sleep will become easier as a result. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I, I remember going on, on holidays um, during the year and a half where I was really struggling with insomnia. And I would go on longer holidays where I didn't have work-related worry and I would have horrible sleep. Mm. So it's definitely not a given for me that... I would be sleeping sleeping well during the holidays. But I think the confidence that I have built during the three months of sleep restriction and having consistently decent, okay, good sleep yeah. during that time frame helped me sleep sleep well and, and have a nice holiday. Yeah. And I've... also remain active during the day and focus on what I was doing during the day rather than what would be happening with me during the night. Yeah, exactly. Um, one thing I wanted to touch upon was, you know, you, you are extending out this sleep window um, as your sleep improved. Um, how did you decide when to extend that window out, you know, and a lot more time for sleep and, you know, how much, to, how, how, how did you do it basically? Right. So I went in 15 minute intervals. So I started mm -hmm. with a six hour sleep window. Um, after uh, I think about four weeks when I had my first week of consistently good sleep, I would add 15 minutes and then I would go maybe in four or five days uh, when I saw consistently good sleep, um, I would add another 15 minutes. And then if that wasn't working for me, I remember going back and forth a little yeah. bit. So I was tinkering with it a little bit. And sometimes I would add also 15 minutes at the end of my sleep window. It depends what fit, what, what was suitable for my schedule mm -hmm. at that time. But um, it was always 15 minutes and I always needed to have five, four or five days of consistent good sleep to add the 15 minutes to my sleep window. 
Yeah, I think that's a that's a good strategy. I like the 15 minute chunks because it's not a big difference. So it shouldn't lead to that much disruption when you first make that change. Um, but it can certainly give you that opportunity to see if you're at that stage where you can get a little bit more sleep. Um, and again, when it comes to how often to change it, um, five days, yeah, I would say that would be like kind of the minimum gap I would suggest leaving. Um, if you're able to go like a week, um, if your sleep confidence is really poor, maybe even just go two weeks just to really make sure you're building up that sleep drive, that consistency in your sleep before making any changes, you know, just because it can be so tempting to make the change. And then one night later you have a bad night. Oh, and then go back and you're just cut. You're just caught in this trap of, I just can't, can't change this. Anytime I change it, my sleep doesn't, doesn't, doesn't improve. It just goes back to where it was. So just making those small incremental changes, um, like no more often than five to seven days is, is, is really the way to go, I think. Right. Like you said, I, I remember one time I went to fast and I added a 15, 15 minutes and then I had consistent few nights where my sleep efficiency was way below average and then I needed to go back and then spend another five or, or six days on my mm. previous sleep plan and then then I could start adding back again. Yeah. But sometimes, sometimes I, I remember I was feeling really eager to get to a certain point. Like for me, six and a half hours seemed like such a long time and I really needed to make the six and a half mm. hours. And then the next real goal was seven and I couldn't wait to get to a seven hour sleep window. And yeah, like it sounds weird to me now. It sounds weird when I say it, but because right now I don't really have a sleep window anymore. Yeah. But yeah, that, that were my goals back then. Yeah, I, I see that a lot with people that I work with. And I think it's natural that you, you're you really keen to make this progress. You really want to extend that sleep window as soon as possible. Um, but the issue is, like, you know from experience that allotting too much time for sleep doesn't lead to more sleep. You know, it just leads to more time awake. So it is really important to remain conscious of that fact, you know, that more time in bed doesn't mean more time asleep but it can certainly mean more time awake and only make those changes when your sleep has responded. You know, when your when your sleep is sh showing you that it is ready to try and get more. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really, really useful insight. So you touched on this now. So what's your sleep like now? We're right at the end now. What's your sleep like now? And what's your life like now? Um, so I would say I definitely don't think about sleep much. Um, I used to think that I, I need six and a half or seven hours. I think when my body was, uh, in more of a state of hyper arousal, I, I needed less sleep, but now I would say it's more like seven and a half, eight hours. Mm -hmm. Um, and I go to bed when I'm sleepy. Uh, usually I would, um, read a book in the evening. I still try to apply uh, some of the things related to, to sleep hygiene that I, I um, have read about. So I definitely don't use my phone and uh, watch news in the evening, but I would read a book. And then when I start feeling sleepy, which is around midnight, um, I will go to bed and then fall asleep within 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I wake up around 8 a.m. Um, I try to sleep, uh, wake up consistently around the same time uh, on weekends, but I occasionally allow myself to sleep in. And sometimes on weekends, I also go to sleep a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would say it's a fairly boring um, sleep schedule. Yeah. Uh, that sounds quite average to most people, but uh, it's great. Yeah, it's that, well, it sounds like you reached the goal because the, the end goal is you just at this point where you don't really think about sleep. It's not this important part of your life anymore. Um, and it's just something you don't spend any time thinking about. So it does seem boring to, to talk about or, th or to think about. Yeah, yeah, right. And I, I honestly didn't think that I would get to this stage because I was obsessed with it and I, I, I would constantly think about it and I would constantly talk about it and I would constantly research it. And uh, right now it's just an afterthought. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So I've got one last question for you. Um, I really appreciate the time that you've spared today. Um, so if, if someone with chronic insomnia is listening and feels as though they've tried everything, they're beyond help, they can't do anything to improve their sleep, what would you tell them? Uh, there is definitely um, 
something that you can try. <laughs> Cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia uh, sounds awful, uh, but it's it's something that really helped me. And if it can help me, uh, if it could help me, it can help anybody. I am pretty sure of that. That's great. Thank you so much for your time, Anna. I think people are going to really identify with your experience and I'm really hoping that it will motivate them to give these CBTI techniques a try because after all, if they can recognize part of their own insomnia in your story and you're now at the stage where sleep is not an issue for you, that means that they can be just as successful as you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Insomnia Coach podcast. If you're ready to implement evidence-based cognitive and behavioral techniques to improve your sleep, but think you might need some additional support and guidance, I would love to help. There are two ways we can work together. First, you can get my online coaching course. This is the most popular option. My course combines sleep education with individualized coaching and is guaranteed to improve your sleep. You will learn new ways of thinking about sleep and implement better sleep habits over a period of eight weeks. This gives you time to build sleep confidence and notice results without feeling overwhelmed. You can get the course and start right now at insomniacoach.com forward slash online. I also offer a phone coaching package where we start with a one hour call. This can be voice only or video, your choice, and we come up with an initial two week plan that will have you implementing cognitive and behavioral techniques that will lead to long term improvements in your sleep. You get unlimited email based support and guidance for two weeks after the call, along with a half hour follow up call at the end of the two weeks. You can book the phone coaching package at insomniacoach.com forward slash phone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Insomnia Coach podcast. I'm Martin Reed, and as always, I'd like to leave you with this important reminder. You can sleep. <laughs>